All over the world, it was an unusually hot summer. Normal weather patterns were disrupted. Agricultural productions, which was challenged by droughts in some places and floods in others. New records for high temperatures were set. These symptoms of global warming appear to have swayed the opinions of former skeptics. In the United States, polls show appreciation of the reality of climate change and of our species' role in it, climbing back to the levels attained before the financial crash of 2008. Yet, as climate scientists have repeatedly warned, awaiting some decisive catastrophe before undertaking action is to commit our descendants to a harsh, even lethal future. The miners who stand around trying to prod their limp canary back into life are almost certainly doomed. <coughs> the evidence provided by heat waves, droughts, and other extreme events is considerably weaker than the case compiled by climate scientists during the past three decades. Even today, unsystematic experience compels while expert testimony goes unheard. Only 15% of Americans are aware of the overwhelming consensus among climate scientists. Nor is this anomalous. Around the globe, nations retreat from initiatives that were already too modest, overriding the drumbeat of well-grounded predictions in favor of attending to issues whose impact on human lives will be tiny in comparison. Yet in one respect, the United States is truly exceptional. No other nation seems to take such infantile glee in exacerbating the problem. The ludicrous policies of the Trump administration appear bent on accelerating the transition to climate disaster. I've begun with this predicament because it's impossible today to discuss issues about truth and science without confronting the striking gap between the conclusions of climate researchers and the policies pursued by almost all the world's governments. Until recently, the natural sciences, together with other forms of systematic inquiry guided by similar methods, we should always remember Diltai and his studies of both the Geisteswissenschaften and the Naturwissenschaften. They seem to be consistently increasing their authority. Of course, it was not always so. Prior to the 17th century, the sources of truth were sought in different places, in scriptural texts and in the wisdom transmitted from the ancients. From the late 17th century on, however, the spectacular successes of Newton's approach to problems of motion spread into other parts of physics, through chemistry to the life and earth sciences. Enhanced abilities to predict and control parts of the natural world redounded to the credit of scientific inquiry. Science emerged as a social institution, one crucial to formulating any reasonable policies. Its authority is by no means completely eroded. Even in countries where many citizens applaud Michael Gove's famous Brexit declaration, we've had too much of experts, the scientific principles involved in civil and aeronautical engineering or in biomedical conclusions about drug safety mostly go unquestioned. An exception is the suspicion of vaccines in some circles. Nevertheless, in at least three major areas of contemporary research, evolutionary theory, parts of molecular genetics, and climate science, doubts about the authority of the sciences are common. This situation raises a number of important questions. First, does scientific inquiry deserve the status it once enjoyed as a privileged source of truth? Second, what has happened to undermine its status in some areas. And third, if the turn against scientific authority is a mistake, what can be done to remedy it? I shall address the first two questions sequentially and end with some brief remarks about the third. The initial effect of the striking successes of Newtonian dynamics was to redirect a quest pursued by our species for tens of thousands of years 
the quest for certainty. During the 18th century, the newfound ability to predict the motions of bodies was impressive enough to convince the learned world that Newtonian inquiries produced blocks of truth that would never require revision. People were rightly impressed. To this day, space scientists use Newton's mechanics to send rockets on the intended trajectories. They don't need the corrections relativistic calculations would supply. But beginning with 19th century optics and subsequent researches into heat, the image of physical science as built on unshakable foundations has had to be revised, and the process of revision continued apace in the 20th century. The theory of relativity, quantum mechanics, as well as the discovery of retroviruses and of dynamic genomes have shown how even extraordinarily successful parts of science may need serious revision. For more than a century, the idea that the natural sciences deliver certain knowledge has given way to the conception of them as using powerful techniques to yield truth or approximate truth about important aspects of nature. A popular way to present this conception is to point to scientific method. Romantic histories celebrate 17th century heroes, Bacon, Descartes, and Galileo, as well as Newton, people who discovered a special way of investigating the natural world. In fact, as their contemporary critics often noted, the methodological maxims hailed by the supposed pioneers were so flabby as to border on triviality, nor were their proposals mutually consistent. Insofar as a method emerged, it was forged in particular studies centered on particular kinds of trials, introducing specific kinds of measurements and subjecting the results to logical and mathematical analysis. During the past decades, philosophical studies of scientific practice, historical and contemporary, have emphasized the methodological diversity of the sciences. It's no accident that particular fields design their own methods courses. What works for the aspiring particle physicist is inappropriate for the apprentice in genetics. One size does not fit all. Nevertheless, with enough tolerance for vagueness, it's possible to identify a method common to the sciences as they have been practiced for the past three or four centuries. Investigators typically begin with what their community regards as established by the labors of the past. In light of the accepted framework, they can identify significant questions suitable for their exploration. The framework supplies a space of options for tackling these questions, and recognition of the options inspires them to undertake certain kinds of experiments or to make specific sorts of observations. Once they've acquired the data they seek, they analyze them using tools that have proved their worth in previous inquiries. Each science builds on and seeks to emulate the successes of its past. My imprecise account differs from many attempts to articulate scientific method in its recognition of research as a community affair. Classical discussions of scientific method are often relentlessly individualistic. Sometimes they proceed as if there were a single, rational way for a scientist to go on at any particular stage. But in fact, the sciences profit from disagreement and diversity. Different members of the community pursue rival approaches to the same problem. The division of cognitive labor, as I've called it, enhances the chances of community success. Well, so far, so fuzzy. I shall bring my picture into sharper focus by considering how climate scientists work out this general method in settling the reality of anthropogenic, that is human-caused, global warming. The greenhouse effect has been recognized for more than a century. It was discovered when the established physics of heat radiation, absorption, and reflection was used to provide a theoretical estimate of the Earth's mean temperature. The simple model initially used predicted a temperature 30 degrees less than the observed value. Further investigation showed that at some frequencies in the infrared, energy reflected from the Earth's surface was re-reflected 
from the atmosphere and thus absorbed. Instead of escaping into space, it raised the Earth's temperature, making up for the predicted shortfall in the global mean temperature. Towards the end of the 19th century, analysis of this re-reflection revealed the effect of particular gases in the atmosphere. So-called greenhouse gases, particularly carbon dioxide and methane, affect the process of atmospheric re-reflection. By the early 20th century, it had become evident that greater concentrations of these gases increase the rate at which energy is returned from the atmosphere and thus raise the planetary temperature. The greenhouse effect is as firmly established as many familiar bits and pieces of scientific law. For example, the judgment that water is H2O. During the 20th century, climate scientists began to make systematic measurements of the concentrations of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and to compare them with the observed data about the planetary temperature. Using a variety of techniques, they extended their findings into the past, producing familiar graphs of the Earth's temperature during the past millennium. Michael Mann's famous hockey stick slow decline over centuries and then a very quick uptick at the end, the blade of the hockey stick. Similar analyses generated graphs showing how carbon dioxide concentrations have varied across the same temporal period. The result was a fine-grained correlation. Although the greenhouse effect would predict the correlation, to conclude that it must be the principal cause would have been premature. Perhaps something else has been going on as well. Other known factors influence the average temperature of our planet. Volcanic eruptions change the chemistry of the atmosphere, increasing the amount of solar radiation reflected into space. Rates of sunspot activity, as well as the character of the Earth's orbit, also make a difference. The final judgment of the importance of anthropogenic global warming rests on probing these various alternatives and showing how they cannot account for the data. It is Sherlock Holmes's approved method in action. You examine all the possibilities, and if just one survives, then however improbable or unwelcome it may be, it has to be accepted as the truth. At each stage of this long inquiry, a community of scientists built on premises that had proved successful in previous investigations. They used those results to identify new questions and to pinpoint possible answers, deployed their background knowledge in finding the empirical data they needed, and explored all the options available within the space of possibilities generated by their framework. The route to consensus passed through numerous disagreements and challenges. The graphs showing variation over time in temperature and in concentration of carbon dioxide were scrutinized, both for the reliability of the techniques used in identifying single figures and for the statistical methods deployed to obtain representative values. Under what circumstances can you trust tree rings or ice cores to testify to the past temperature at particular places? How do you legitimately construct the past history of the Earth from a set of numbers drawn from different places at different times? Similarly, attention has been paid to how the various alternative causes of temperature fluctuations might affect the historical record. Despite the efforts of prominent climate scientists to explain, the technical difficulties of this are difficult for outsiders to assess. At the end of the day, however, an overwhelming majority of climate scientists, 97% in President Obama's famous estimate, 99.9% .9 according to others, have agreed on the accuracy of the graphs and the inability of alternative causes to account for the observed trends. Lay folk, people like you and me, well, there, probably, there may be some climate scientists here, though, though they should be excluded from my last remark, um, can appreciate the structure of the case for climate change. This is just the way the sciences are supposed to proceed. 
Individual researchers build on the efforts of the past. They explore all the options. The previously constructed framework counts as plausible. They pore over the details of one another's claims. Arguments and counter-arguments fly. And in the end, consensus emerges. So what's the basis for doubt? Well, as I conceded, outsiders can't probe the details for themselves. But that's a banal fact of life. It applies to the sciences across the board. Why do we believe the particle physicists and the synthetic chemists and the molecular geneticists who offer to trace our ancestry or assess our risks for various diseases? The obvious answer, because they can do such amazing things. Sometimes a domain of scientific research will win public trust because of its ability to control some aspect of the natural world, to produce crops, say, that can grow in inhospitable regions. Often the success comes in the precision of forecasts. Despite Richard Feynman's disarming confession that nobody understands quantum mechanics, its ability to predict some events with an accuracy comparable to measuring the distance between New York and Los Angeles within the width of a human hand generates the conviction that it must be on the track of truth. Although the predictions of climate science are not quite in that league, its theoretical basis rests on eminently comprehensible parts of physics and chemistry. Climatologists have been able to predict a range of phenomena, for example, the effects of volcanic eruptions. It would be hard to dismiss their work across the board to conclude that this is simply an immature science, not yet worthy of public trust. Not only does climate science look like science, it also comes from a community that often achieves the kinds of successes inspiring trust in science. Climate scientists can't be dismissed as fools, but maybe they are villains. Perhaps climate change is a hoax, albeit not one perpetrated by the Chinese, as our current president would have it. Are climate scientists bound together in a gigantic conspiracy designed to feather their own nests? Before I take up that question, it's time to probe a bit more deeply. I've tacitly assumed something, a familiar bit of philosophical law. Emphasizing the role of success in generating trust in science, I've proposed, presupposed a thesis at the heart of a familiar dialectic, the famous no miracles argument for believing in science. The argument can be stated as a rhetorical question. If an area of science produces striking successes, wouldn't it be miraculous if its central assumptions weren't approximately correct? So finally, the concept of truth emerges in my discussion. But as Pontius Pilate once asked, what is truth? Common usage on both sides of the Atlantic takes statements to be true when they accord with the facts. That conception of truth, going back at least to Aristotle, is often expressed philosophically as the correspondence theory of truth. A sentence is true just in case it corresponds to reality. Throughout history, much ink has been spilt on how to understand this notion of correspondence. Some thinkers have wondered whether the notion can be given any clear sense. Others have doubted our ability to assess correspondence with reality on the grounds that there's no Archimedean point from which we can inspect both our statement and the pertinent bit of the world and determine that they match. Since the pioneering work of the 20th century logician Alfred Tarski, the mysteries can be partially dissolved. Tarski's achievement consisted in showing how to define truth for the simplest sentences, so-called atomic sentences, and then recursively specifying the conditions for sentences built up using logical particles, connectives like and and or and not, quantifiers, words like for all and some. For our purposes, a look at the basic case will do. Consider an elementary subject predicate sentence. Donald Trump is a buffoon, say. The name, as I have just used it, refers to an individual who unfortunately currently occupies the White House. The predicate is a buffoon, picks out a set, 
comprising just those people whose antics properly arouse laughter, and sometimes derisive laughter. The sentence is true just in case the individual identified by the name belongs to the set selected by the predicate. After Tarski, defenders of the correspondence theory suppose the link between language or thought and the world to be carried by referential relations between names and objects and between predicates and sets whose ultimate constituents are objects. How does anyone determine when the referential relations give rise to the appropriate connections? Not by occupying any Archimedean point. That's an absurd fantasy. Sometimes we do it through mundane procedures. I observe a sample of Trump's actions and experience my own responses to what he does. Often, however, no such direct route is available. In those cases, we're forced to see whether the sentence plays a role in successful action. And here comes the familiar dialectic. Skeptics point to a gap between success in predicting or controlling reality and truth understood as properly structured referential relations. A powerful way of making the case is to point to instances in which successful action was based on judgments long abandoned as incorrect. Historically oriented philosophers of science follow Larry Loudon's lead in presenting what they call the pessimistic induction on the history of science. Look back into history, they urge, and you will find any number of highly successful sets of assumptions once widely accepted as true on the basis of those recognized successes that have turned out to be false. Why should our own situation today be any different? How impressive were the discarded theories of the past? Some of the alleged examples Ptolemaic astronomy, alchemy, and phlogiston chemistry were not successful to anything like the degree of contemporary sciences. So the supposed basis of the inductive generalization can be whittled away a bit. But troubling instances remain. Prominent among them is Fresnel's wave theory of light. In 1818, when the French Academy reviewed Fresnel's submission for its advertised prize, the mathematician Poisson calculated what he took to be an absurd consequence of the analysis. Fresnel's account of wave propagation predicted the existence of a bright spot at the center of the shadow of a small disk. The prediction prompted Poisson to dismiss the proposed wave theory of light out of hand. But another member of the prize jury, Arago, reacted differently. He went home, set up the apparatus, and observed closely. And he found the predicted spot. This extraordinary prediction, defying common sense, led to the immediate triumph of Fresnel's wave theory. In one of the lovely ironies of history, the Poisson bright spot is named for the man who doubted its existence. It's very hard to deny the success of Fresnel's theory. It was striking enough to reverse entrenched judgments. Yet, the theory, as he presented it, has long been rejected. Central to his account is the idea of an all-pervading medium, the ether, in which light waves are propagated. From a 20th century perspective, Fresnel's talk of the vibrations of ether molecules seems quaintly misguided, as does James Clerk Maxwell's confident claim that the ether was, this is almost a quote, as well established as any other entity in accepted science. Actually, the term he used was natural philosophy. Indeed, for more than a century, physics has abandoned appeals to the ether. Nevertheless, Fresnel's mathematics of wave propagation, the mathematics Poisson used to derive the supposedly absurd prediction, continues to figure in the physics textbooks. Aspiring physicists have to learn it even today. Retrospectively, the equations governing wave propagation can be disentangled from Fresnel's faulty but understandable assumption that wave motion always needs a medium through which the waves travel. The working part of Fresnel's optics was correct, but he added on an unnecessary false assumption. Properly understood, 
This case reinforces the view of success as a token of truth. What implications does that have for our confidence in the claims of the contemporary sciences? Reassurance comes from the survival of Fresnel's mathematics, the working part of his theory. But it must be accompanied with a sober reminder. Today's research may be beset with the same kinds of understandable confusions from which Fresnel suffered. Retrospectively, people can separate the working bits from the idle wheels. But just as Fresnel was unable to tease apart strands in his theory of very different quality, so too contemporary scientists may give credit to ideas they incorrectly suppose to be essential to their success. They may be doing imitations of Maxwell all over the place. Future investigators are likely to look back on our science and offer the same mixed verdict to deliver, delivered when we consider Fresnel and other comparably great figures from the past. This point can be deepened. It's been persuasively argued that the history of scientific revision exhibits a recurrent pattern. Apparently successful theories give way to new ideas with even greater success, not simply by advancing new hypotheses couched within the same language, but by reconceptualizing the phenomena. From the new perspective, our great predecessors had begun to grasp important aspects of nature, but they were handicapped by thinking about the problems they tried to tackle in inadequate ways. The ideas central to advancing were beyond their conceptual horizons. Appreciating this pattern in the history of science yields a deeper version of the pessimistic induction. Contemporary scientists ought to expect that the language in which they formulate their theories will be displaced in favor of more adequate concepts. They should think of themselves as lacking the right language for speaking the truth. Does that really follow? Imagine thoughtful researchers pondering the patterns in the history of the sciences and asking themselves how those patterns should bear on their attitudes towards the work they do and the claims they make. Should they be more tentative in relying on hypotheses that appear to them to be essential to the successes in predicting the course of nature? Although they appreciate their own fallibility in identifying the working parts of their theories, although they recognize the possibility of progressive shifts in the conceptual framework they deploy, they should point out, nonetheless, the virtues of taking successful science seriously. Attempts to build on what appears successful typically increase the range of the successes and even expose the points of weakness. Perhaps, like Fresnel's mathematical analysis of wave propagation, major features of the science to which they contribute will endure. If, however, they are discarded in some future conceptual shift, the historical patterns reveal how those advances are themselves promoted by serious commitments to the successful science of the age. Either way, they win. The attitude of combining modesty our findings might need revision. With seriousness, but we take them to be true, is an excellent strategy for inquiry. Despite all the alleged cautions from history, successful science deserves the authority often attribute to it, if attributed to it. Now, the scientists that I've just imagined are pragmatists. Like many self-styled pragmatists, they are vulnerable to charges of playing fast and loose with truth. Critics will take the dialectic I've just reviewed to expose a gap between success and truth. The scientists reassure themselves by envisaging an indefinitely extending sequence of ever more successful theories produced as each generation of researchers contributes to the enterprise by building on the successful science of the day. However long the sequence proceeds, critics see no reason why what is generated should be truth, real truth. Correspondence to reality might remain permanently elusive. I envisage two ways of responding to this accusation. 
The first intensifies the pragmatism. Two of the great trinity of classical pragmatists, Charles Sanders Peirce and William James, formulated what is known often as the pragmatic, pragmatist theory of truth, or the pragmatic theory of truth. Although it would more properly be understood as a proposal for applying the concept of truth in practice, my imagined scientists opt for the less accurate popular version. They reject the idea of correspondence truth in favor of an alternative definition. Truth, they say, is what is fated to be accepted in the long run of collective inquiry. That's Peirce's exposition of the concept of truth. Or what works in the way of belief in the long run and on the whole. That's James's formulation. Thoroughgoing pragmatists of this stripe adopt a notion of truth that closes the alleged gap by brute force. Critics will, will characterize this strategy as philistinism. Success in prediction and intervention is not enough. My imaginary pragmatist scientists ought to reply that treating truth as an end in itself is a mistake. The will to truth is the last version of what Nietzsche called the ascetic ideal. That's an important corrective to romantic rhetoric about the priority of truth over everything else. But it needs to come to terms with a banal fact. On occasion, people seek the truth without aiming at any further goal. A number of admirers of the dramatic works of Shakespeare are passionately interested in finding out whether the plays were written by a man born around April the 23rd, 1564 in Stratford, or whether someone else was responsible. They wouldn't be satisfied if they were informed by some apparently omniscient source that a particular authorship hypothesis would be completely successful in coping with all the evidence that would arise in an indefinitely extended inquiry. What they want is a statement that corresponds to events in England between the late 1580s and 1616. So, I prefer a milder pragmatism. One according with the actual views of Person James that seeks to reconcile the pragmatist criterion with the correspondence theory that descends from Aristotle. Success connects to truth, not by way of any abstract metaphysics, but through a commonplace generalization. Experience provides all of us with evidence for supposing that successful action typically requires an accurate understanding of how things are. Throughout our lives, we constantly find ourselves in situations in which we're required to represent to ourselves predicaments beyond our direct access. You have to coordinate your actions with others whom you can't contact, and you have to use your understanding of them to figure out what they are likely to do. Later, when the occasion is over, and you've either succeeded or failed, you can find out what their actual decisions were, and thus appraise the hypotheses you formed in making your own plans. Perhaps the purest examples of this scenario occur in some games, card games and board games, for example, where your winning or losing depends on understanding the hidden distribution of cards or pieces. These kinds of predicaments occur sufficiently frequently in our lives to teach us the intimate relationship between success and truth. Pragmatism takes advantage of the lesson to contend that the approach embraced by my imaginary scientists is likely to deliver truth or approximate truth, not only in some specially tailored sense, but also as it's traditionally been conceived. So far, a long and winding defense of the sciences as sources of truth. I'm now going to turn to the second question, and try to understand why in certain areas the authority of science is rejected. My answer will come in two parts, corresponding to two historical phases. I'll start with an account that until relatively recently might have been completely adequate. Skeptics about climate science or evolutionary theory or the claims of molecular biologists that GMOs are safe, are unlikely to question the general strategy of community inquiry I outlined earlier. What they deny is that the troubling field has pursued this strategy in the proper way. 
they don't see this as stemming from incompetence. Rather, they claim, research has been skewed and distorted because investigators have introduced their own values. Climate science has been tailored to support political causes that have failed when they've been pursued in more honest and open ways. The alleged evidence for Darwinian evolution is contrived by people who want to spread atheism and undermine religious values. Defenses of GMOs are constructed by people who hope for some share of the profits amassed by the agricultural conglomerates they serve. When they attack these particular sciences, the skeptics often see themselves as staunch defenders of science as it ought to be. Far from rejecting the important place science plays in human life and in shaping social policy, they want to hold scientists to the proper ideals. Prominent figures in the questionable fields are viewed as activists, betrayers of the scientist's role. Indeed, because they can sometimes co-opt popular rhetoric about ideal science, the skeptics can sometimes recruit allies within the scientific community, even from members of the disputed field. Some climate scientists have publicly regretted James Hansen's activism and criticized him for overstepping the boundaries within which an objective scientist ought to remain. Hansen was instrumental in bringing, originally bringing anthropogenic global warming before the general public. This version of the skeptical challenge relies on an ideal widely accepted among practicing scientists. According to that ideal, science should be value free. Societies need an institution for acquiring, certifying, storing, and transmitting information. And when science is properly embedded in a society, there's a fruitful division of labor between researchers and citizens. The folk work out what they want to achieve. They decide what goals to pursue and what values to strive for. Scientists then inquire into the important questions that arise, how to reach those goals, how to realize those values. And in that pursuit, they shouldn't import values of their own. If the division of labor functions well, investigators don't just take up the issues that happen to interest them, nor do they let their own prejudices interfere with the search for new knowledge. They serve a larger public. Now, it's easy to see the motivation for this simple story. The human tendency to overlook or to suppress unwelcome facts is all too obvious. Nevertheless, if the picture of inquiry I've painted is at all accurate, the simple story won't do. Value judgments enter in in many places. They're evident in the selection of problems for investigation. More crucially, as Heather Douglas has forcefully argued, once research is underway, value judgments are constantly needed. Scientific investigations typically proceed in stages. Individual scientists plan experiments, carry them out, and then assess whether the evidence is good enough to warrant deploying some hypothesis at the next stage of their inquiry. Try to go too quickly, and you're likely to fall flat on your face. Dither and run too many trials, and your investigation will be inefficient. It will take much more time than is necessary to deliver its eventual conclusions. Some rival will very probably scoop you, and win all the credit. Researchers are constantly attending to the costs and benefits of the options they face. They ponder both the consequences for themselves, how they will fare in competition for scientific credit, and the consequences for a broader community, how the collective research of their field will advance, how the interests of society will be served by the investigations to which they contribute. The last kinds of value judgments not only appear innocuous, but even rightly made. Imagine an inquirer of impeccable high-mindedness, someone who tries to tailor research so it, it, can, it can be expected to deliver as much human good as possible. At each stage of the investigation, our pure researcher decides to continue assembling evidence just to the point at which the optimum human benefit is achieved. To delay further would diminish the value of what is given to the broader public. To have treated matters as settled earlier would have run an unacceptable risk of doing harm. 
I'll continue the thought experiment. Let's embed our pure researcher in a community. All members of the community are equally pure. Their purity leads them to certify a new result at exactly the point when the collective research indicates that it will do most good. Our pure community is full of people making value judgments, but all those value judgments ought to provoke applause. They express an admirable public spiritedness of the kind rarely found among those whose decisions and actions shape the quality of human lives. Once the inevitability of value judgments in research is recognized, shouldn't we want all the various sciences to become pure communities? No, we shouldn't. Pure communities may well be less good than groups of researchers in which some much grubbier value judgments play a role. If you're surprised by that fact, simply imagine for the moment that purity comes with a cognitive limitation. Any conclusion reached by the pure is delivered at the moment at which it produces optimal human benefit. But the rival community, the solid community, manages to generate a more impressive set of results. The timing of those results is imperfect. Sometimes, in particular, researchers leap ahead of the evidence, and this even causes some harms. But the solid community makes up for this by finding its way to conclusions missed by the pure, conclusions of such human importance as to overwhelm the losses resulting from cutting corners. But why, you will surely ask, should we think that purity would limit cognitive achievement? Answer because purity produces uniformity. The pure always choose the most promising line of research. They pursue that line at the same rate. Effectively, they reduce a whole community to a single individual. Real life scientific communities are very different. They're full of ambitious people convinced that their way of attacking some crucial question is more likely to pan out than the approaches taken by their benighted competitors. Indeed, as I've argued elsewhere, sometimes scientists choose to fly by the seat of their pants simply because they know that too many people are concentrating on a particular popular way of tackling a big problem. Or they reject the best way of proceeding because they know they are less skillful at some of the techniques it requires. If they are to crack the problem, if they are to be the ones to receive the plaudits, the grant money, the Nobel Prize, or whatever, they will have to try something different. And sometimes, trying something different makes a big difference to community success. Instead of a homogeneous group of people recapitulating the same strategy, the competition for credit tends to encourage investigators to explore different approaches. Actual science is permeated by a credit economy. The striving for credit expresses individual value judgments. It would be good if I were the one who wins the race to solve this problem. But those judgments can enhance the human good generated by a research community. Not all the value judgments made in a healthy group inquiry need be wonderfully broad commitments to human well-being. It may be a good thing that purity among scientists is relatively rare. Quite obviously, however, these individual value judgments can cause trouble. Researchers bent on gaining credit are sometimes tempted to cut corners, to try to find out what the competition has discovered, to steal or to massage the data, even to supply results from trials that were never conducted. It's important, then, that the passion for being right for being the one who finds the truth, not interfere too much with the pure impersonal wish that truth be found. In practice, the balance is struck in two ways. First, through subjecting announced discoveries to the scrutiny of competitors. Second, by using the ideal of devotion to the collective pursuit of truth to impose severe penalties on investigators whose misdeeds are publicly exposed. To be sure, these mechanisms are imperfect. Scientists who make up findings to support results nobody will ever attempt to build on are likely to escape detection, but they will also not gain much in the way of credit. 
those who falsify the evidence in support of a hypothesis that directs future successful research will, however, receive ample credit, even if they've only made a lucky guess. But they know that if their confidence is misplaced, they may well be forced out of the scientific community. And so now I can address the question of whether climate change is perpetrating a hoax. What would lead a research community to fabricate consensus? Two motives are typically suggested. Perhaps the climate scientists are endeavoring to promote political ends, or maybe they are driven by the desire for large-scale funding of their research. If you understand how scientific communities actually function, neither proposal passes the laugh test. The political inclinations of any sizable group of scientists vary, and some climatologists are adamantly opposed to any liberal agenda. Moreover, the prospects of gaining massive amounts of money for research would be large for anyone prepared to unmask the phony consensus. Given the dynamics of the credit economy, you ought to expect any attempt at conspiracy to break down. There will always be a strong motivation for whistleblowing. Add in the fact that the climate consensus is international and that no scientist has the power of a mafia don, and the idea of a cleverly planned hoax should be dismissed as a ludicrous fantasy. Ironically, however, the brouhaha about anthropogenic global warming does expose another dangerous side effect of the credit economy. During the past few decades, scientists have come to appreciate the importance of communicating their fields to a wider public. Popularizer is no longer an epithet of abuse. In consequence, a new role has opened up for credit seekers. Identify yourself as the brave one, the heir of Galileo, willing to take uncomfortable truths to a broader audience. Scientists with tenuous ties to climatology, a few meteorologists and a scattering of physicists, have found patrons in fossil fuel companies and right-wing think tanks. The search for credit has led them to break the rules almost without impunity, since they have already left or transcended the research communities in which they once work. Their dissent is a significant part of the story of how trust in climate science has been eroded. Because they participate in free and open debate. The kind of debate often viewed as vital to democracy. Friends of free speech and open debate, like John Stuart Mill, typically envisage an ideal forum, I'll call it the million arena, in which public discussion occurs. Defenders of open discussion tacitly take for granted a particular view of this arena. They assume that the discussion will represent all major points of view, that those who speak will not be biased towards some particular position. There is apparently a microphone to which any member of the society may have access. As for the honesty of the speakers, that's supposed to flow from some potential check that would punish errors. Those who speak falsely will be shown up and their opinions discounted. Furthermore, it's also crucial for open discussion to run an orderly course so it won't be protracted forever because partisans of a specific point of view find ways to reiterate their claims indefinitely without engaging with the arguments directed against them. Fans of the million arena envisage a parade of speakers, irreproachable in their sincerity, lucid in their speech, taking their turns at the public microphone and courteously retreating when they have said their piece. It is a charming Victorian vision, but it isn't the way we live now. When the business of providing information to the public is literally a business, subjected to the pressures of the marketplace, issues that very rich citizens would prefer to see ignored can easily be sidelined, either through the direct means of not having them reported, or by creating so much obfuscation around them that public frustration is aroused. The tactic of fair and balanced reporting in which two implacably opposed partisans trade opinions for some short period of time is well designed to realize the second approach. 
Blurring the difference between informing and entertaining creates a pressure against the serious work of explaining complex issues, placing further obstacles in the sober assessment of the evidence. The value of the ideal of free speech seems to me indisputable. The ability to become informed is crucial for democracy. Genuine commitment to democracy involves trying to enhance the freedom of citizens. In its turn, that requires mechanisms for transmitting information on issues central to our lives. The ignorance so devastating to democracy is originally systemic. The circumstances for free discussion were shaped to accommodate issues citizens we could reasonably be expected to decide for themselves in an age when at least some avenues for disseminating information were subjected to accepted standards of responsible conduct. Under various pressures, some technological, some economic, the institutions have evolved. Many of the problems we now face turn on the details of investigations few people can understand, let alone appraise for themselves. So as a complex of institutions adapts to a changing environment, ignorance is systematically produced and the million arena fails to fulfill its function. Yet it would be naive to suppose that the evolution of free discussion has gone unremarked. What began as the unplanned fostering of ignorance has been recognized by those to whom ignorance and confusion are welcome. The merchants of doubt now work to maintain an evolved set of social institutions that suit their purposes. But this is only part of the story. As events of recent years have made abundantly clear, more is going on. Any adequate account of continuing climate ap apathy, attending, for example, to the failures to set appropriate targets for reducing emissions, even when the problem is acknowledged, must pay attention to three other factors. The increasing penetration of the internet into human lives, the rise of populism, and the tolerance for bullshit on a grand scale. It's a familiar fact that increased use of the internet has fragmented people into small groups, united in their dependence on a set of sources of information. The political movements often characterized as populist are fostered by this fragmentation of the citizenry. At the heart of populism lies self-identification. A particular group sees itself as the people. In declaring this identity, the group rejects the betrayal of its nation's values by dominant institutions, pledging to reclaim national traditions from the debasement they have suffered under influential elites. Pursuing the hope for restoration takes precedence over other political projects. If so-called experts warn of future harms, calling for preventative action, their counsel is dismissed. The corruption of supposed authorities must be overridden by the wisdom of the folk. As Michael Gove said, we've had too much of experts in this country. In this great struggle, the function of political language shifts. Truth and evidence become irrelevant. Although it's become commonplace to castigate politicians for lying, a better diagnosis of the current proliferation of falsehoods would be to recognize the rise of bullshit in the sense given to it by Harry Frankfurt, a famous American philosopher. The bullshitter is simply not interested in whether the sentence he utters are true or false based on evidence or free-floating speculations. Words are tools to be used in political battles. Announcements and speeches are tailored to reassure and excite the people the leader claims to represent, the true people, the beating heart of the nation. What the audience and maybe others hear in his words is an attitude towards the dire state of the country the country they love, a fierce determination to make it once more the place of their nostalgic dreams, a place in which they, the true people, once again have a place. The literal sense of what is said is irrelevant, and so too is the truth value. Under these three conditions, the omnipresence of the internet, the attractions of populism, and the tolerance of bullshit, 
chances of orderly debate about a complex issue like climate change tend towards zero. Whether the reality of anthropogenic global warming is disputed or conceded hardly matters. A significant fraction of the citizens, not only in the United States, but in many affluent democracies, identify calls for climate action as manipulative efforts aimed at producing outcomes their political opponents, the elites who have already wrought so much damage to the nation, have always wanted. Even when signs of climatic shifts cannot be dismissed, when wildfires break out on an unprecedented scale or temperate regions experience extraordinary heat waves or droughts, the remedies proposed by climate activists are viewed with deep suspicion. Particularly irksome is the call for international cooperation as part of a plan to respond to climate change. Globalization and global entanglement are seen as having contributed to national decline. Suggestions that past polluters might be morally required to pay reparations to developing nations or that fighting climate change requires the extension of democratic institutions across national boundaries are particularly repugnant. Populism encourages withdrawal. Nations quit larger unions. Groups within nations seek partition and the restoration of individual cultures. At a time when new connections and new agreements on an international scale are so urgently needed, the political 